tissue and dinosaur bones, an update. I'm going to start the update by using uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, the article on Mary Higby Schweitzer. Um, it's a pretty good summary. I apologize in advance for its creationist bias, but um, <clears throat> Mary Higby Schweitzer is a paleontologist at North Carolina State University who is known for leading groups that discovered the remains of blood cells in dinosaur fossils and later discovered soft tissue remains in Tyrannosaurus rex specimen MOR1125, as well as evidence that the specimen was a pregnant female when she died. Um, Lotus it just says blood cells. It doesn't say microstructures consistent with blood cells or any of that kind of stuff. Interesting for Wikipedia. Um, more recently, Schweitzer's work has shown molecular similarities between Tyrannosaurus remains and chickens, providing further evidence of the bird-dinosaur connection. So you can see how uh, the evidence is being pointed in a direction that Wikipedia likes. Uh, biography, Schweitzer learned, uh, earned a BS in communicative disorders from Utah State University in 1977 got a Certificate of Secondary Education in Broadfield Science from Montana State University in 1988. Under the direction of mentor Jack Horner, she received a PhD in Biology from Montana State University in 1995. You'll never guess what it was in. It was in, what are those things in those bones? This has been known since 1995 at least. She has three children. Uh, based at North Carolina State University, Schweitzer is currently researching molecular paleontology, molecular diagenesis, and taphonomy, evolution of bird physiologic and reproductive strategies in dinosaurs and their bird descendants, and astrobiology. Why astrobiology? Because they, the tissues are preserved when they shouldn't be. So maybe if we find life somewhere else or traces of life, we will find tissues where they shouldn't be either. Astrobiology. Astrobiology. It, is a, it is a science without a subject right now. But it's exciting to think about. Uh, discoveries. So now we'll have the prep. In 2000, Bob Harmon, now notice she had her PhD in 1995. So she knew about kind of the kind of stuff, stuff you should expect well before this. But this is, this is where she got a break. In 2000, Bob Harmon, chief preparator of paleontology at the Museum of the Rockies, discovered a Tyrannosaurus skeleton in Hell Creek, Montana. After a two-year retrieval process, Jack Horner, director of the museum, gave the femur leg bone to Schweitzer. Uh, Schweitzer was able to receive uh, retrieved proteins from this femur in 2007. And of course, that's the article that gave her the breakthrough. So she had her PhD in 1995, and she was arguing that there was stuff in there for a long time, and finally she got her big break. Schweitzer was the first researcher to identify and isolate soft tissues from a 68 million year old fossil bone. The soft tissues are collagen, a connective protein. Amino acid sequencing of several samples have shown matches with the known collagens of chicken, frogs, newts, and other animals. I am curious as to why they didn't use alligators. Prior to Schweitzer's discovery, the oldest uh, soft tissue recovered from a fossil was less than one million years old. Schweitzer has also isolated organic compounds and antigenic structures in sauropod eggshells. With respect to the significance of her work, Kevin Padian, curator of paleontology, University of California Museum of Paleontology, has stated, chemicals that might degrade in a laboratory over a short period need not do so in a protected natural env chemical environment. It's time to readjust our thinking. By the way, that's Wikipedia's um, ellipses, not mine. Mine will be marked in yellow. Um, wait a minute. Kevin Padian? Haven't I heard that name before? Well, it turns out in Wikipedia you can click on Kevin Padian, and this is what you get. 
Kevin Padian, born 1951, is a professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley. So he's at Berkeley. Curator of paleontology, University of California Museum of Paleontology. So he's, you know, museum curator. And president of the National Center for Science Education. Haven't I heard that name before somewhere? Does the name Eugenie Scott ring a bell? As a matter of fact, you'll never guess who one of Kevin Padian's graduate students is. Nicholas Matsky. So just to give you an idea of who they're quoting when they um, when they are praising um, uh, it goes on to say that Padian's areas of interest is vertebrate evolution, especially the origins of flight and the evolution of birds from theropod dinosaurs. He served as an expert witness for the plaintiffs in the Kitzmiller versus Dover. You ever heard of that um, court case? trial, and his testimony was repeatedly cited in the court's decision. Hmm. Now, let's go back to that again. Kevin Padian, curator of paleontology at the University of California Museum of Paleontology, and all those other things, said chemicals that might degrade in a laboratory over a short period need not do so in a protected, protected, protected natural chemical environment. It's time to readjust our thinking. Hmm. That doesn't sound like cited from a uh, science article, does it? So where did they get that? Well, they actually have a reference. So if you go to the reference, you get uh, SF Gate. And um, uh, they have a, an article that's entitled T-Rex Tissue Offers Evolution Insights. And uh, it says, UC Berkeley, this is just one of the paragraphs. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Obviously, we can't do that here. We don't have time, but you'll get uh, the flavor of wh where this quote came from. You know, UC Berkeley dinosaur evolution expert Kevin Padian, who is not involved in this new research, the Schweitzer research, noted that for 15 years, this is being said in 2007, Molecular biologists had been insisting that Schweitzer could not possibly get molecules out of a 68 million year old fossil. Just couldn't happen. And that her methods were flawed despite all the many tests she used that confirmed her work. And Kevin Padian's comment is, but the lesson she's saying now is that nature doesn't work like a lab bench, Padian said. Chemicals that might degrade in a laboratory, this is our familiar quote, over a short period need not do so in a protected natural chemical environment. And here's our ellipsis. Mary Schweitzer is just the best there is. So, it's time to readjust our thinking. Woo! Now, why is it so good all of a sudden when before everybody was criticizing it? Well... As for the Harvard work sequencing the ancient protein for the first time, Padian called it a brilliant technical achievement, and it's because we know that birds evolved from dinosaurs that it makes sense. So you see, if you can find the protein and you can say it's related to bird protein, then we can push the bird-dinosaur angle and we can kind of ignore those problems with how it could last that long. Continue with Wikipedia and Schweitzer. <clears throat> Schweitzer previously announced similar discoveries in 1993, two years before she got her PhD. Since then, the claim of discovering soft tissues in a 68 million year old fossil has been disputed by some molecular biologists. Later research by Kay et al. published in PLOS One challenged the claims that the material found is a soft tissue of Tyrannosaurus. We're going to look at that briefly. A more recent study, October 2010, published in PLOS One, contradicts the conclusion of K and supports Schweitzer's original conclusion. The extraction of ancient DNA from di dinosaur fossils has been reported on two separate occasions. 
But on further inspection and, uh, inspection and peer review, neither of these reports could be confirmed. Citation needed. Uh, you can't believe that stuff, but I can't really prove that to you. The extraction of protein from dinosaur fossils has been confirmed. So we do have uh, protein. Schweitzer also has discovered that iron particles may play a part in the preservation of soft tissue over geologic time. Of course, if you believe in ge ge geologic time, then you have to have some kind of a mechanism for this stuff to last for 68 million years when everybody else has been saying for, well, ever since people have been saying that uh, it's all been replaced and there can't be any original material left. I mean, I'm old enough to remember being taught that when I was a, a relative youngster. Um, the reference 12 is entitled Tissue is Biofilm, or is, is entitled Dinosaur and Soft Tissues Interpreted as Bacterial bio Biofilms. So, and it's found in PLOS One 2008 and it's available on the lab, on the internet, pardon me. And uh, the abstract reads, the scanning electron microscope survey was initiated to determine if the previously reported findings of, quote, dinosaurian soft tissues, end quote, scare quotes, I guess, could be identified in situ within the bones. The results obtained allowed a reinterpretation of the formation and preservation of several types of these tissues and their content. And uh, it goes on to say mineralized and non-mineralized coatings were found extensively in the porous trabecular bone of a variety of dinosaur and mammal species across time. They represent bacterial biofilms common throughout nature. Um, uh, the variety of dinosaur, that's probably stretching it a little bit, but there aren't that many. What? Uh, well, the, the truth of the matter is I think the abstract is probably a little more enthusiastic than the paper itself is once you get into the details. Um, biofilms form endocasts and once uh, dissolved out of the bone mimic real blood vessels and osteocytes. They coat the, they coat the, the, uh, the blood vessels which then disappear but the biofilms are left and so it looks like you've got blood cells. It looks like you've got blood vessels and osteocytes. Bridge trails observed in biofilms indicate that a previously viscous film was populated with swimming bacteria. Carbon dating of the film points to its relatively modern origin. Now, of course, at this point, my ears are really perking up. And uh, a comparison of infrared spectra of modern biofilms with modern collagen and fossil bone coating suggests that modern biofilms share a closer molecular makeup than the modern collagen to the coatings from fossil bones. Blood cell-sized iron oxygen spheres found in the vessels were identified as an oxidized form of formerly pyritic framboids. That's a collection of iron sulfide that got oxidized to iron oxide. Our observations appeal to a more conservative explanation for the structures found preserved in fossil bone. And you can see the pull of this kind of explanation because then those aren't really dinosaur. Uh, and you don't have to explain how they lasted for millions of years. Or do you? Let's take a look at this again. I'm going to look at the carbon dating in particular and point out the implications. All specimens for carbon dating were handled under a flow hood with clean sterile gloves and instruments. The specimens were pressure fractured to reveal fresh surfaces. A bone fragment from the lance formation was microscopically examined and coatings that appeared to have been dislodged were removed for analysis. 50 milligrams of material were sent to Geochron Labs, Cambridge, Massachusetts, for accelerated mass spectrometry analysis. The results were 139 plus or minus 0.1, uh, pardon me, 0 0.01, plus or minus 0.65 percent of modern uh, 1950 carbon-14 activity. That's PMC for those of you who are familiar with the terminology. And um, 
Now, I will point out that 139.01% modern carbon means that most of that carbon has been obtained since about 1955 or thereabouts. You see, in 1945, we were at 97% modern carbon, which we had been at since about 1750 or thereabouts. And then uh, we blew up a bunch of bombs, atomic bombs first and hydrogen bombs later, all of which produced a huge number of neutrons and all of which converted a great deal of carbon, uh, of nitrogen-14 to carbon-14 by something called an NP reaction, the same reaction that produces carbon-14 under ordinary circumstances. And so the carbon in the northern hemisphere went up to about 180%. And then it gradually came back down. We sitting here, uh, all of our tissues except for our bones, which are s still got a little bit left over from before, um, are running approximately 115% modern carbon. So what this means is that the biofilms, assuming that they actually happened, would have had to have been deposited in the last uh, 50 years. Now ask yourself the question, if that's the case, how do you preserve um, let's say uh, modern biofilm, uh, pardon me, modern, uh, the, the old vessels until about 1945, 1950, 1955, somewhere in there, and then deposit modern material on them, isn't that almost as hard as preserving the original tissue for the whole time? This doesn't really solve the problem. In order to determine, another quote from the same area, in order to determine if the mineralized biofilms were ancient in origin, a sample of material removed from the vascular canals was subjected to carbon-14 dating. The results were greater than modern, indicating a modern origin for the material. Well, at least in their particular bones, I think that's a fair statement to make. But what it suggests is that even in their bones, the stuff lasted until about 19... 50, 1955, something like that. And, you know, the difference between lasting until 1950 to 1955 and lasting until 2015 when this is done is really insignificant on a geologic time scale. In other words, the paper just shot itself in the foot. Well, but, but what was there to contaminate? Why does it form all these nice little structures? The structures lasted until the biofilm got there. That was only 50 years ago. You see, you haven't solved the problem. You just made it worse in some ways. Anyway, the opposing argument pointed out uh, J. Peterson, influence of microbial biofilms on the preservation of primary soft tissue in fossil and extant archosars, which you'll notice is also in PLOS one. Um, and uh, again, the, this is available for perusal on the internet. Um, talks, uh, it, it has a, a, uh, an abstract that's separated into three parts, background, Mineralized and permineralized bone is the most common form of fossilization in the vertebrate record. Preservation of the growth soft tissue is extremely rare, but it, recent studies have suggested that primary soft tissues and biomolecules are more commonly preserved within preserved bones 
than had been presumed. Some of these claims have been challenged, and they reference the previous article, uh, with presentation of evidence suggesting that some of the structures are microbial artifacts, not primary soft tissues. The identification of biomolecules in fossil vertebrate extracts from a specimen of Brachyphosphosaurus canadiensis, uh, Brachyolophosphosaurus, has shown uh, the interpretation of preserved organic remains as microbial biofilm to be highly unlikely. These discussions also propose a variety of potential mechanisms that would permit the preservation of soft tissues in vertebrate fossils over geologic time. And now the uh, methodology and principal findings. The study experimentally examines the role of microbial biofilms in soft tissue preservation in vertebrate fossils by quantitatively establishing the growth and morphology of biofilms on extant archosaur bones. These results are microscopically and morphologically compared with soft tissue extracts from vertebrate fossils from the Hell Creek Formation of southeastern Montana, the uh, latest uh, Maastrichtian, in order to investigate the potential role of biofilms on the preservation of fossil bones and bound organic matter in a variety of taphonomic settings. Taphonomic is burial. Based on these analyses, we have highlighted a mechanism whereby this bound organic matter may be preserved. Conclusions and significance, the results of the study indicate that the crystallization of micro microbial biofilms on deco decomposing organic matter with invertebrate bone in early taphonomic stages may contribute to the preservation of primary soft tissues deeper in the bone structures. Basically, biofilms not only could go inside the bone and do whatever, but they can also seal off the bone, particularly whole bone, uh, to where nothing can get in. And uh, I'll just to summarize the, the, uh, the main part of the study. The study took chicken bones, birds, and American alligator bones, reptiles, and buried them in a sinkhole in the Yucatan Peninsula. And no, uh, which had salt, fresh water at the top and salt water at the bottom. And there was, uh, if you go down far enough, it's anoxic. And they noted that the biofilm sealed the whole bones and allowed for some preservation. So basically, uh, biofilms are actually the bone's friend. Um, doesn't replace it necessarily, especially if the bones are whole. Um, I will call your attention to a, an article in the Smithsonian uh, uh, a magazine by Helen Fields entitled Dinosaur Shocker. The whole thing is worth a read, but I'm only going to read about three or four paragraphs from it. Um, the, the summary uh, paragraph is probing a 68 million year old T-Rex. Mary Schweitzer stumbled upon astonishing signs of life that may radically change our view of the ancient beast. This is written in 2008, shortly after the uh, science article came out. Uh, of course, what everyone wants to know is whether DNA might be lurking in that tissue. Uh, Whitmire, from much experience with the press since the discovery, calls this the awful question. Whether Schweitzer's work is paving the way, uh, paving the road to a real-life version of science fiction's Jurassic Park, which, as you know, is it just produced a whole bunch of spin-off movies. Um, books before that, where dinosaurs were regenerated from DNA preserved in amber. But DNA, which carries the genetic script of an animal, is, very is a very fragile molecule. It's also ridiculously hard to study because it is so easily contaminated with modern biological material, such as microbes or skin cells, while buried or after being dug up. Uh, moving on past that to the Next paragraph. Um, Young Earth creationists also see Schweitzer's work as revolutionary, but in an entirely different way. They first seized upon Schweitzer's work after she wrote an article for the popular science magazine Earth in 1997 about possible red blood cells in her dinosaur specimens. Well, yeah. Uh, Creation <coughs> magazine claimed that Schweitzer's research was powerful testimony against the whole idea of dinosaurs living millions of years ago. It speaks volumes for the Bible's account of a recent creation. I would have to agree with them. It's certainly a, that at least it's um, easier to explain if you're a short-aged person. 
and then a theme which is recurring in the, um, and we'll see it again in another uh, magazine article, um, recurrent in the popular reporting of this. This drives Schweitzer crazy. Geologists have established that the Hell Creek Formation where B-Rex was found is 68 million years old and so are the bones buried in it, period. She's horrified that some Christians accuse her of hiding the true meaning of her data. They treat you really bad, she says. They twist your words and they manipulate your data. For her, science and religion represent two different ways of looking at the world. Invoking the hand of God to explain natural phenomena breaks the rules of science. After all, she says, what God asks is faith, not evidence. If you have all this evidence and proof positive that God exists, you don't need faith. I think he kind of designed it so we'd never be able to prove his existence, and I think that's really cool. Now, I will point out that evidence and proof are two different things. And I think there's a little mixing up there. But um, uh, we'll go on to look at the uh, article uh, by Discover Ma Magazine. It's called Schweitzer's Dangerous Discovery. Dangerous? Why? Does it, is it really that bad? And uh, again, the... the uh, the subtitle goes, when this shy paleontologist found soft, fresh-looking tissue inside a T-Rex femur, she erased a line between past and present. Then all hell broke loose. Why? Well, this actually gives a little more background, and that's why I've emphasized this article more than the previous one. Ever since Mary Higby Schweitzer peeked inside the fractured thigh bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex, the introverted scientist's life hasn't been the same. Neither has the field of paleontology. Actually, as we've noted, she started long before this. Two years ago, Schweitzer gazed through a microscope in her laboratory at North Carolina State University and saw lifelike tissue that had no business inhabiting a fossilized dinosaur skeleton. Fibrous matrix, stretchy like a wet scab on human skin. What appeared to be supple bone cells, their three-dimensional shapes intact, and translucent blood vessels that looked as if they could have come straight from an ostrich at the zoo. Again, they're not mincing words here. There's none of this, you know, abundance of caution, microstructure stuff. When they write it, it's blood cells. By all the rules of paleontology, such traces of life should have long since drained from the bones. It's a matter of faith among scientists. I like this. It's a matter of faith among scientists uh, that soft tissue can survive at most for a few tens of thousands of years, not the 65 million since T-Rex walked what's now the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. But Schweitzer tends to ignore such dogma. She, dogma in science? Are you kidding? I thought that science didn't have dogma. Um, she just looks and wonders, pokes and prods, following her scientific curiosity. This has allowed her to see things other paleontologists have missed. Maybe because they couldn't bear to see it. I don't know. And potentially to shatter fundamental assumptions about how much we can learn from the past. Yes? If biological tissue can last through the fossilization pro process, it could open a window through time, showing not just how extinct animals evolved, but how they lived each day. Fossils have richer stories to tell about the love dub of dinosaur life than we've been willing to listen to, says Robert Backer, uh, curator of paleontology at Houston Museum of Natural Science. This is one spectacular proof of that. So apparently he's one of her fans at this point. At the same time, the contents of those T-Rex bones have also electrified some creationists. Yeah? Who interpret Schweitzer's findings as evidence that Earth is not nearly as old as scientists claim. I invite the reader to step back and contemplate the obvious, wrote Carl Wieland on the Answers in Genesis website last year. Uh, this discovery gives immensely powerful support to the proposition that dinosaur fossils are not millions of years old at all, but were mostly fossilized under catastrophic conditions a few thousand years ago at most. Now, 
as I'm reading this, and I'll read most of it, I think all of the relevant passages, um, I want you to pay attention to what exactly was dangerous about Mary Schweitzer's discovery. Rhetoric like this has put Schweitzer at the center of a raging cultural controversy because he is not just a pioneer and paleontologist, but also an evangelical Christian. That fact alone has prompted some prominent paleontologists to be even more skeptical about her scientific research. Why? Why? She agrees with them on the time. She agrees with them on the mechanics. Why would they be suspicious of her because she's a an evangelical Christian. Interesting question, no? Um, some creationists have questioned her work from the other direction, pressing her to refute Darwinian evolution. But in her religious life, Schweitzer is no more of an ideologue than she is in her scientific career. In both realms, she operates with a simple but powerful consistency. The best way to understand the glory of the world is to open your eyes and take an honest look at what is out there. Now, that's the sentiment I could agree with. Reticent by nature, Schweitzer rarely grants interviews and shies away from making grand pronouncements about her scientific research or her religious faith. And uh, having met her myself, I would have to agree with that statement. Instead of news stories about her stunning findings, she has adorned her office wall with a verse from the book of Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And skipping over a few paragraphs, Schweitzer's first forays into paleontology were a total hook, she says. Not only was she fascinated by the science, but to her, digging into ancient strata seemed like reading the history of God's handiwork. Schweitzer worships at two churches, an evangelical church in Montana and a non-denominational one when she is back home in North Carolina. And when she talks about her faith, her bristly demeanor falls away. Bristly demeanor? You know, I read the article. I couldn't yeah. figure that one out. I, I've met her. I, I don't know where the bristly demeanor was coming from, but anyway. To, con uh, to continue the, uh, uh, the discussion, uh, the, the paragraph, uh, God is so multidimensional, she says, I see a sense of humor. I see his compassion in the world around me. It makes me curious because the creator is revealed in the creation. Unlike many creationists, she finds the notion of a world evolving over billions of years theologically exhilarating. That makes God a lot bigger than thinking of him as a magician that pulled everything out in one fell swoop. So you get an idea of what she's thinking about, skipping over a paragraph. She had already seen signs of exceptional preservation in the early 1990s. So, you know, again, before 1995 when she got her PhD. While she was studying the technical aspects of adhering fossil slices to microscope slides. One day a collaborator brought a T-Rex slide to a conference and showed it to a pathologist who examined it under the microscope. The guy looked at it and says, do you realize you have red blood cells in that bone? Schweitzer remembers. My colleague brought it back and showed me and I just got goosebumps because everyone knows these things don't last for 65 million years. When Schweitzer showed Horner the slide, she recalls, Jack said, prove to me they're not red blood cells. That's what I got my PhD doing. PhD was finished in 1995. So this has actually been around for a long time. She first ruled out contaminants and mineral structures. Then she analyzed the putative cells using a half dozen techniques involving chemical analysis and immunology. In one test, a colleague in injected rats with a dinosaur fossil extract. The rodents produced antibodies that responded to turkey and rabbit hemoglobins. All the data supported the conclusion that the T-Rex fossil contained fragments of hemoglobin molecules. The most likely source of these proteins is the once living cells of the dinosaur, she wrote in a 1997 paper, which is you know, well before her 2007 science paper breakthrough. That article published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which means it should be available on the internet, by the way, sparked a small flurry of headlines. Horner and others regarded Schweitzer's research as carefully performed and credible. Nevertheless, says Horner, most people were very skeptical. You don't suppose. Frequently in our field, people come up with new ideas and opponents say, I just don't believe it. 
she was having a hard time publishing in journals. Hmm. Schweitzer was also stymied by her unconventional fusion of paleontology and molecular biology. I'm going to just read the next three paragraphs, kind of uh, the first line of them, because it gets the point. Soldiering on with minimal funding for eight years. Then she found that stretchy stuff inside a T-Rex femur. And of course, that's the stuff that went into the science article. So it's his breakthrough, like her early insight into the cadaverous odor of, odor of dinosaur bones, emerged from the f fossil fields of the Hell Creek Formation, rugged badlands so remote that much of it lacks even pa unpaved roads. Tucked into Montana's northeast corner, Hell Creek was one of the last places on Earth dominated by dinosaurs before they became extinct. And I'm going to skip over a lot of it. On the flip side, Jeffrey Bada, and if you don't recognize that name, he used to work with a guy by the name of P. Edgar Hare, whom some of you may know. Uh, and uh, they did a lot of work on amino acid dating. An organic ge geochemist at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego cannot imagine soft tissues surviving millions of years. He says the cellular material Schweitzer found must be contamination from outside sources. Must be, because it couldn't be there, because if it were there, here's why. Even if the T-Rex had died in a colder, drier climate than Hell Creek, environmental radiation would have degraded its body, Bada says. Bones absorb uranium and thorium like crazy. You've got an internal dose that will wipe out biomolecules. Maybe not instantly, but over 65 million years, you would expect that. Hmm. Others question Schweitzer's thoroughness. The pictures were stunning, but the paper fell quite short, said Hendrik Pointer, a molecular evolutionary geneticist at McMaster University in Ontario. Schweitzer has not proved that the elastic tissue she found actually consists of molecules from the original dinosaur. Point, uh, point R uh, ticks off. A list of tests Schweitzer could have conducted, including searching for the building blocks of proteins and then sequencing them to determine their origin. I understand you want to get your papers out quick and flashy, Pointer says, but I'm more in favor of longer work with slam duck authenticity. Schweitzer agrees. I am a slam duck scientist, she says. I would have much rather held the paper back until we had reams and reams of data. But without publishing a journal article, she says she could never have hoped for funding. Without the papers in science, I didn't stand a chance, she says. That's the saddest part about doing science in America. You're totally driven by what gets you funding. Since publishing, so I just conducted many of the analyses Point R suggests with initially promising results. For a scientist, the ultimate test is having independent researchers replicate your results. So far, there hasn't been a mad rush to do so. Few have expertise in both molecular biology and paleontology, not to mention the passion needed to carry out such work. But there is activity, and they give one or they give several examples, and I'm just going to read the first one. Patrick Orr at University College Dublin is bringing together a geologist and organic geochemist to look for soft tissue in a 10 million year old frog fossil. And uh, to continue, while sci scientists struggled to make sense of the bones, another community had no doubts uh, about how to interpret the results. The reports were quickly embraced by biblical, biblical literalists who believe God created life on Earth less than 10,000 years ago. For decades, they've been working to place a scientific patina on their ideas. Uh, I'm not sure I phrased it that way, but whatever. The Institute for Creation Research runs a graduate school near San Diego with 11 instructors who hold doctorates in biochemistry, geology, and other sciences. That, well, this is back in 2008, I think, or 2009, so I don't think it had, I th don't think it had moved quite yet. But uh, you're right, it has since moved to Texas. Um, and also, a good share of their people have scattered and they're recollecting, I think. Um, Conferences offer papers on topics like the physics of the Genesis flood. Anytime there's empirical evidence, that's gold for them, says Ronald Numbers, a professor of the history of science and medicine at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Wait a minute. Why wouldn't it be gold? 
isn't it kind of nice to have uh, creation scientists actually looking for empirical evidence? Uh, this is just strange. Uh, the 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 approach. It's. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That I can say it's wrong, but it's, but it's. It, it, it the tone is off somehow. To Schweitzer, trying to prove your religious belief through empirical evidence is absurd. You notice they keep coming back to this, if not sacrilegious. If God is who he says he is, he doesn't need us to twist and contort scientific data. She says. The thing that's most important to God is our faith. Therefore, he's not going to allow himself to be proven by scientific methodologies. Uh, again, confusing evidence and, and proof, I think. But it's a common misconception. Some creationists, notice, noting Schweitzer's evangelistic faith, have tried to pressure her in deciding with him. It is high time that the scientific community comes clean, meaning that the public is going to hold them accountable when they find out that they've been misled. Reads an email, recent email message Schweitzer received. She has received dozens of similar notes, a few of them outright menacing. These religious attacks wound her far more than the scientific one. It rips my guts out, she says. These people are claiming to represent the Christ that I love. They're not doing a very good job. It's no wonder that a lot of my colleagues are atheists, she told one zealot. If, you know, if the only picture of Christ I had was your attitude toward me, I'd run. Yeah. Ironically, the insides of Cretaceous era dinosaur bones have only deepened Schweitzer's faith. My God has gotten so much bigger than I, since I've been a scientist, she says. He doesn't stay in my boxes. You know, if we could just keep that point alive and allow her to grow rather than insisting that she grow at our rate. Truth is, Schweitzer hasn't even bothered to look for DNA. She's simply hunkered down to look in, work in her characteristic way, keeping her eyes and her attitude wide open. So many things are coming together that suggest preservation is far better than we've ever given it credit for. She says, I think it's stupid to say you're never going to get DNA out of dinosaur bones. You're never going to get proteins out of dinosaur bone. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. As a scientist, I don't think you should ever use the word never. And of course, I would raise the question at that point and leave it as a question for her. You think we should never say, well, we know that it's 68 million years old? and it couldn't possibly be younger. And just let it eat. Anyway, um, again, if you listen to that, you ask yourself, what is dangerous about Schweitzer's discovery that would, that would call it uh, Schweitzer's dangerous discovery? Um, and, uh, of course, then there's the most recent paper, Schweitzer MH et al., A Role for Iron and Oxygen Chemistry in Preserving Soft Tissues, Cells and Molecules from Deep Time. And again, this is available on the internet. Um, the, it's the Royal Society uh, that published it. And the abstract reads, the persistence of original soft tissue in Mesozoic fossil bone is not explained by current chemical de degradation models. Notice the frank admission right up front. It shouldn't be there. We identified iron particles, a geothite uh, alpha uh, ferric oxide, hydroxide, associated with soft tissues recovered from two Mesozoic dinosaurs using transmission electron microscopy, electron energy loss spectroscopy, micro X ray diffraction, and iron micro X ray absorption near edge structure. Iron uh, chelators increase fossil tissue immunoreactivity to multiple antibodies dramatically, suggesting a role for iron in both preserving and masking fossil proteins in fossil tissues. And uh, con continuing the um, abstract, the hemoglobin increased tissue stability more than 200-fold from approximately three days to more than two years at room temperature in an ostrich blood vessel model 
developed to test postmortem tissue fixation by cross-linking or peroxidation. Hemoglobin-induced uh, solution hypoxia cu coupled with iron chelation enhances preservation as follows. Hemoglobin plus oxygen is greater than hemoglobin without oxygen is greater than oxygen itself, or hypoxia itself, and which is greater than, much greater than just plain oxygen. The well-known oxygen heme interactions in the chemistry of life, such as respiration and bioenergetics, are complemented by oxygen heme interactions in the preservation of fossil soft tissues. That's the abstract. Um, I'm going to move over now to uh, confirmation of dinosaur tissue. It's an article called Fibers and Cellular Structures Preserved in 75 Million Year Old Dinosaur Specimens by Bertazzo et al. And it's found in Nature Communications, and it is, I think, this month was when it was finally published. Um, all of the people are from Imperial College London. None of them are named Mary Schweitzer. This entirely independent group. And again, the abstract is exceptionally preserved organic remains are known throughout the verte vertebrate fossil record, and recently evidence has emerged that such soft tissue might contain original components. We examined samples from eight Cretaceous dinosaur bones using nanoanalytical techniques. The bones are not exceptionally are not exceptionally preserved and show no external indication of soft tissue. They just looked anyway. In one sample, we observed structures consistent with an endogenous collagen fiber displaying approximately 67 nanometer banding, indicating the possible preservation of the original quaternary structure. Uh, using uh, TOF SIMS, we identify amino acid fragments typical of collagen fibrils. There's collagen in there. Furthermore, we observe structures consistent with putative erythrocyte remains that exhibit mass spectra similar to emu whole blood. Emu, of course, being a bird uh, somewhat related to ostriches. Using advanced material ca uh, characterization of approaches, we find that these putative biological structures can be well preserved over geologic time scales, and their preservation is more common than previously thought. Now notice, they don't really say that. They don't really do that. We find that these putative biological structures can be well preserved over geologic time scales. What they actually show is that they're there, right? And, um, and whether they're preserved for millions of years is an open question. The preservation of protein over geologic time scales offers the opportunity to investigate relationships, physiology, and behavior of long extinct animals. And to uh, give you a few paragraphs and a few pictures from the, uh, from the uh, article, models proposed to account for such preservation and indicate that it should be the exception rather than the rule. You notice that. Everybody says it shouldn't last that long. Now people are saying, well, sometimes it does last that long, so it must be able to, but who knows? In particular, it's long been accepted that protein molecules decay in relatively short periods of time and cannot be preserved for longer than 4 million years. Therefore, even in cases where organic material is preserved, it is generally accepted that only parts of the original protein are preserved and that the full tertiary or quaternary structure has been lost. It's got to be. It's just got to be. Well... You know, as Mary Schweitzer says, keep your eyes open and see what you can see. Here, we examine eight dinosaur bones from the Cretaceous period, none of which are exceptionally preserved. We used electron microscopy and a focused ion beam as part of a novel method to prepare samples for mass spectrometry. First, with a scanning electron microscope, we observed in four different samples structures resembling calcified collagen fibers from modern bone. In three other samples, structures enriched in carbon, and in two other, other samples, structures that resemble erythrocytes from birds. Serial sectioning of one sample presenting fibers and of one uh, presenting the erythrocyte-like structures revealed that these fibers are less dense than the matrix surrounding them, and that an internal structure is present inside the erythrocyte-like structures. 
with a transmission electron microscope. And we're going to see a, a photo of that in just a minute. Um, we observed that the fibers show a 67 uh, nanometer banding, which could possibly be considered collagen fiber remains. Finally, using mass spectrometry, we found peaks that are consistent with fragments of amino acid present in collagen. The spectra obtained from the erythrocyte-like structures are surprisingly similar to the spectra obtained from the whole blood of an extant emu. And these are actually four photos of, of uh, various structures that were found by scanning electron microscope. You'll notice that B is the form the backdrop to our, our slides so far. And, um, and uh, you know, here's some fibrils uh, in C and D. Um, and there's a close-up of B. And uh, here's the... Um, Here's the 67 nanometer banding, and you, I mean, it, it looks pretty classic. You know, you can see the bands. Doesn't take a lot of imagination to find them there. Now, my take on all this. The last article shows that structures compatible with dinosaur tissue components can be found by others than just Mary Schweitzer. This is a real phenomenon. There's tissue in those bones, period. It seems to me that the preservation mechanism proposed for 65 million years is not adequate. That is to say, the people who object that it can't possibly be are right. I think both sides of the argument are right. And if you adjust the time frame, both can be right. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Seems to me uh, there's so many things to talk about here, but I'll, I'll just raise a, a basic question that uh, when Mary Schweitzer was here, you know, she she was asked this question, of course, about uh, recent creation, and she stated uh, that uh, I can't believe that God would produce so much evidence for long ages. Uh, just to fool us. In other words, uh, the data that we see out there, uh, there's just too much of it there for me to adopt a recent creation. And so she has moved into this uh, two areas of thinking, dichotomous, uh, Stephen Gould's separate magisteria type uh -huh. of thing. Uh, there's science on one side and then there's faith on the other side. That's a very popular uh, position. It makes, your, it makes your faith immune to any oh, evidence in science. Th there's a lot of it uh, uh, even in this building here. Uh, it's a common uh, view that you take to uh, escape. Yeah, of course it makes your faith issue. totally unable to influence anything uh -huh. in the real world if you keep going far enough because science yeah. will grab everything uh -huh. that exists eventually if you let it. Uh, she feels there's just too much data there for long ages. That's her feeling, therefore. She, 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 drops, she adopts these two different magisteria, faith and science. And, and faith, you're, you're in la-la land, kind of, uh, as far as data is yeah. concerned. And I was noticing that, that both I, Discovery Magazine and Smithsonian are quite happy to let her do that. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's about the only way out you can have, if, unless you're going to adopt the idea that you're an atheist, and that's not all that popular in society at present. 
uh, it is more popular than it used to be, but it's not all that popular. Uh, the the uh, I think the basic objection you can raise to to this is uh, how can reality have two different modes of existence, two different realms that are separate? If it's reality or if it's truth, truth. Uh, has to be consistent in all areas. It's not truth. Uh, and uh, it's a convenient way to avoid the issue, uh, but it's not a way to find truth. If you're looking for truth, uh, you ought to be open to all ideas. You can't say, well, uh, there's a God, but I'm going to follow science when I'm... Uh, you know, this is a dictum, you know. A lot of scientists believe in God, but only on weekends when they go to church. Uh, they have a different mode of thinking, uh, and that's, that's, they split into a different thing. But if you're looking for truth, you've got to be open to all possibilities. Yes, you And do. it comes back to this thing that uh, I've mentioned before here, that uh, you know, in, in the middle of the 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century, science rejected God out of the picture. And it restricted its viewpoint. And in restricting its viewpoint, it restricted the possibility that God was active in nature. And in doing that, uh, it restricted the possibility of finding truth. What if God exists? That question is not asked in science. And more important, what if, what if God is, is in fact active in nature? Yeah, well, that's uh, what would be yeah. implied by that. Uh, so I, I, it seems to me that's, uh, it's not a way to go. If you're looking for truth, you ought to be open to all views. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have anybody over here that I'm ignoring? or? No. I have a then, quick question we'll, we'll, for my friend, Dr. Roth, since you mentioned Mary Schweitzer was on this campus, and I was not here to hear uh, her presentation. Did anyone ask her how the first life originated? No, we, we didn't get into that issue with her. But, uh, uh, I'd rather not. I, I just, I mean, I, I suspect uh, uh, when you face, face that, you know, that just impossible question of life arising by itself, you know, you, you suspect, well, uh, that doesn't involve the time issue and so on, so she, she might be sympathetic to, to creation yeah. by God. I would make one other comment on this, this whole issue, and that is that I think that we are far more effective when we're dealing with people like this to ask questions and let them think about it than to demand them to join our side immediately. Um, if they're not ready yet, then you're uh, then you're asking uh, you're asking a lot, and you're asking actually somebody under pressure, and you may actually harden them against your view rather than vice versa. Uh, remember, she does not, at least as far as I know, have tenure yet. I'm pretty sure she didn't when she, uh, 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 you know, if she, she goes off the reservation, she could lose her job, she could lose all of that research. And it would be trashed as creationist at that point. Leave her alone. Let her decide between her and God what is going on and when she should be announcing it. I, I think it's a huge mistake for us to... Now, I'm hoping that most of the people who wrote those nasty emails are not Adventists. Um, but unfortunately, I, I wouldn't put it past some of our conservatives to think in the same general pathway. I think that the absence <coughs> of a ever-burning hell will probably make us a little bit more cautious about that. Uh, you know, I don't even think that the uh, ICR would say things like that. You know, they would say, look at the evidence. It's so obvious. And then they would drop it and they wouldn't say Mary Schweitzer is just being, uh, uh, you know, uh, ignoring the evidence or being dogmatic or whatever, you know. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, whenever w any of us deal with this kind of thing, that we, that we think about how we sound as well as, as well as whether we're right or not. 
You know, uh, Stephen Gould wrote this book, Rocks of Ages, and he proposed these two different magisteria of you know, science and faith. Uh, and uh, it's been used conveniently, but it's also been severely challenged by some people. Now, I, some people feel, you can't have two realities, folks, if you're finding truth, there's only one. Well, I, I, okay. I understand that Steve Gould also um, had somebody that wrote in and said, I hope you get cancer. And then he, beca and then he got cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, he's not listening to that. Yeah. And he, he specifically, when he announced that he had cancer, he told the folks, some creationists have written to me and told me, I hope you get cancer. And I tell you, this is a very sobering uh, thing. Yeah. And uh, he says, I'm here to tell you their prayers have been answered. Uh, but the, the, any prayers for him changing his mind are not going to be answered at that point. It's, you know, it's, 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 a tra it's tragic. That, it's uh, a mistake. And, and I think what happened uh, last week, uh, which town was it? It's, uh, it's Char uh, Charlottesville. South, South oh, no, Carolina, Charleston, anyway. Charleston, Charleston, Charleston. Charleston, yeah. This is sobering. It's right along the same line, you know. Uh, Christians aren't angels, always. And uh, we could learn from, from a lot but from that. But those, those people were pretty close to angels. I mean, you hear them, you hear them, you know, forgiving him. And you know, the... That's the most galling thing that they could do to him as long as he maintains his position is because he wanted to start a race war. And they're refusing to do it. Uh, he, to he totally miscalculated. Um, Wondering whether if uh, someone right about the day after creation had cut down one of the trees that was uh, standing up there and whether it had one ring or 370 rings. And I suspect that the trees were fully mature with all the rings that you would expect, except they were one day old trees, but they had the full rings. And I suspect that if you had done a bone scan on the bones of Adam, he would have been a bone scan that was appropriate for a gentleman age 35, 40, 45, maybe 50 years old. And if God creates those as a mature creation, then the ground and the minerals and the ratios of different isotopes in the ground would have been a mature ratio as well. And so that uh, I think God has a little bit more idea of what to do and we're now faced with his forming a mature creation, and we're now seeing the results of a creation that the bones or the the uh, rocks and minerals may appear to be 300 million years old, even though they were one day old the next day. I, I think there is some truth to that. I think there's another uh, point that, that needs to be uh, brought out, and that is that Mary Schweitzer may not know all the things that um, uh, some of us know. And that therefore judging her by our standards may not be appropriate. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, we creationists have not always gotten our message out very much, and you can't blame some people for not accepting mm -hmm. it when they haven't heard it. Uh, my guess is that she's very much unaware of the, uh, well, she may be now, but she certainly, I, I think when she started out, she was completely unaware of the problem of carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. everybody was unaware of that until probably 19, or, or 2012 or thereabouts. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, we need to, before we judge, we need to collect a little evidence. 
in fact, uh, probably the best procedure is to leave the judging to the uh, guy who judges the best. Robert, the question is uh, definition of maturity. I don't see a way we can know that. But yeah, I was going to just simply say that uh, it seems to me schizophrenia is more um, popular than we suppose it to be. That kind of thinking religion on one side and then yeah. science on the other. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very popular. I was just going to comment about the two realities. Sometimes you do come up with two realities when none of them answer all the questions. Like um, there's two realities when it comes to light theory. You got the wave and the particle theory. They're both different realities, but yet they both work. Um, and it turns out that the, that the more correct theory, I don't know if we can say the absolutely correct theory, but the more correct theory incorporates parts of both of them. That's right. And um, Schweitzer probably just thinks that there's, she can't in her mind figure out mm -hmm. that everything, both realities have all the answers. And so she's got both of them right now, which to me makes lots of sense. Now, uh, I know there's only one reality, but we've got a brain that's not quite mature yet. Uh, not to mention the information that's not completely that's mature. That's right, that's right. Um, the other thing about the, the pre-oldness that God puts into creation, uh, I'm not quite agree with that. It, it um, sounds to me like he would um, create the earth with fossils in it. And um, if you did that, you wouldn't be quite telling the truth. And um, the light coming back from stars, they've all got, they got sunspots modulated on them. So why would he do that? If a scientist looks at a star that came back, light that came back millions of years ago, and you've got all that data stuff happening, why would he do that? So we've got to we got to look at the evidence as telling the truth. Mm -hmm. He doesn't plant evidence. Well, I think the most creationist, uh, short age creationists, would say that the fossils, in fact, aren't planted, and that in fact uh, the dinosaur data that we're looking at right now, the easiest explanation of it is that it hasn't been that long. I think it's like saying uh, the truth is it was, it was a lie. Uh, just might mention uh, a little bit about the article you mentioned about her defense of iron chelation as a means of preser preservation. Uh, she did do the experiment for two years and found that it lasted quite a bit longer but I think probably next week you'll be discussing problems with uh, molecules lasting that long and uh, bonds between atoms lasting that long uh, and so on, which uh, uh, she is defending the preservation possibility, which uh, this looks like it for, for the scientific community. What they're going to move, move into is say, well, uh, Obviously, molecules can be preserved that long, obviously, so on. Uh, they're not going to the mode saying, uh, no, the dinosaurs are young. Uh, and she uh, kind of is defending the scientific view that, hey, these things are old in some way or other. They were preserved. Yeah. But she does, in that article, mention just in one little clause in it, that uh, the physical data is against it. That's right. Well, I mean, she, she acknowledges that nobody was expecting this, including herself. Uh, it's, it's, you know, can you really do it that long? 
well, she has a paper that might possibly make it, but I, I really have a little trouble thinking that just there was that much blood in the dinosaur bones and therefore they're preserved. Uh, you know, what would be fascinating is to start asking the question, well, is there a correlation between the amount of preservation and the amount of blood in the dinosaur bones? Because that's the next obvious question. Yes. At the risk of seeming scrappy, Dr. Rolf said that some people are scientists six days and um, Christians on the seventh day. You may remember that Brian Bull expressed that very thought in a presentation. I was astounded in my naivety, so I asked him, what was the response to your statement? And he said, response? Oh, a couple of people told me it was a nice presentation, but that's the only response I got. And I'd like to say, the evolutionists are not quiet about presenting their view amongst us, but the, the creationists are a milk soppy bunch. They don't do much. Last week I made a statement and afterwards was assured that there are many ardent creationists on this campus. I'll take that by faith, not evidence. <laughs> <coughs> well, to be, to be fair, I'm making a few waves right now, and there's another gentleman. Uh, there's another gentleman here who's written a number of articles and books uh, with the express purpose of making the points that you're asking to be made. Uh, Ariel Roth, and there's another person who is just writing a book right now, Dick Schaefer, who uh, uh, is. Uh, is trying to approach it from his own point of view. So we are having people that are saying stuff. I, I think one thing that we, I'm glad that we're not being known for is getting into Brian Bull's face and saying, you know, you're wrong and uh, if you don't repent, you're bound for hell. Pardon me? Leonard Brand's book too. So there are people, there are people who are making uh, noises about it, but I think that we're being careful not to say that all of the people who disagree with us uh, are therefore, uh, you know, disagreeable and, and you know, it, the thing of it is that even if it were true, I'm not sure that it's always productive. I mean, you look at what's happened to Mary Schweitzer with a few people who got a little over enthusiastic. I don't think it really swayed her opinion very much. So I, I think we're going to have to be mostly on the positive and here's what we have and here's the difficulties I have going the other way uh, rather than a, and you guys really know better and you're keeping information from everybody and you're just you're not admitting what's what is obviously true and uh, you know God damn you which is what we're saying. <coughs> and I, that, me saying that sounds like I'm swearing. I'm not. I'm quoting somebody who really means it, not somebody who's just using it in an offhand way. To me, uh, I would like to see and uh, have a discussion with people like Mary Schweitzer about some of the geological features out there that are so convincing of a rapid deposition. And I'm speaking of the tremendously widespread layers that are out there that you just cannot put that into any contemporary model. You have to put it into a catastrophic model. I'm speaking of the lack of erosion at paraconformities, the residual carbon-14 and so on. Uh, we're not short of some good arguments in favor of a recent creation, although the overwhelming tone of the scientific literature is otherwise. 
but they ignore stuff. Uh, for example, the Shinaram conglomerate. How do you keep something suspended in water for thousands and really hundreds of thousands of square miles? The, the, what he's talking about, that layer, folks, is uh, it's only about 100 feet thick. You go out there and you look at it, and it's this place. It's got you look rocks at it, in it. And it's got sand and coarse rocks in it and so on. It's got even uh, some blocks the size of a small car. But uh, it's, this thing is only about 100 feet thick, folks, and it's spread over 100,000 square miles. Uh, you can see it around the Grand Canyon region. You can see it in Utah all over the place and so on. How in the world are you ever going to spread a layer 100,000 square miles under present conditions? Furthermore, how would you ever find something flat enough on which to spread it? Not in today's world, you would. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you go out there and you study those layers out there, folks, you have no choice. The back, the, the past was very different than the present. Present topography is up and down all over the place, you, especially in the Paleozoic Mesozoic. It's just flat layer after flat layer after flat layer rain for hundreds of thousands of square miles. Uh, Morrison Formation, 400,000 square miles. Uh, Chinle, 315,000 square miles. I mean, it's incredible out there. It's a different world. That's positive creationism. And I hold it under their nose and some ask them to explain. Uh, we, we do every chance we get. One of the interesting things is that most of the time they won't come on forums like this. <laughs> Very unfortunately, we believe more what we want to believe than what the evidence is and we, we need to be we need to be careful and uh, always face the data squarely. Okay. Proof Bonnie. would proof could be coercive. If the proof for creationism were absolutely, you know, the evidence were actually unquestionable, then we would quote unquote have to be creationists because we were forced to be, because we couldn't escape the evidence that had been proven to be true, and that way we couldn't have faith. We'd have to believe in God. So my, th my thought is that God does not and will not provide overwhelming proof. He will provide evidence, enough that faith can, can realize that there is evidence. The heavens do declare the glory of God. But uh, faith is a moral choice. Do I want to be submissive to this creator? Do I believe that there is a creator I am to be submissive to? Yeah. That's a moral choice. It's a love choice. I was curious about one of the early slides where it said, uh, if I remember correctly, it was preserved in nature, but they couldn't preserve it so well in a laboratory, which I didn't think made much sense. Um, I read yesterday in the paper um, that the, uh, similar to what we were discussing today, although over a much shorter time frame, that the uh, Kennewick man, that uh, supposedly pretty old, um, I think it was 8,500 years supposedly, um, you know, sort of prehistoric Native American man that they found up in Washington. And they had that big fight between the Indians and the, the scientists and all that stuff over testing it. Well, finally, whatever, they got around to testing the guy, and he is actually related to the, to the Indians. And then the Indians hadn't wanted to give any DNA or, or you know, submit to the testing of this guy because they were afraid that, you know, it might not be related, and that would destroy their stuff. And the scientists were, 
you know, wanting to prove that he isn't related, well, turns out they were all wrong. <laughs> that he was actually Native American. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> they were able to show that DNA was preserved in these bones for 8,500 years, not, you know, necessarily millions, but again, longer than they thought that DNA could be preser preserved, you know, and then they were able to extract it and do the test. So, shows that everybody should be a little bit cautious on all, all this stuff about not preserving DNAs and what, what the kind of things the results and, you know, and the, the scientists and the Indians, they had, you know, this big fight and everybody's, you know, made all this mess of this stuff and kind of shows that <laughs> maybe everybody should be a little more cautious. <laughs> well, I will tell you that at uh, Southern Adventist University, they went up and got some stuff from permafrost uh, in, uh, that's supposed to be Eocene, and they're, they're busy sequencing it, uh, which is very interesting. And it's actually fascinating because most people who believe in a flood believe that the Ice Age came relatively rapidly afterwards. So, and then of course, once it's frozen, then it's, it's just like you put it in your deep freeze or something, you know. Uh, the specimens last for, you know, th several thousand years, and it wouldn't surprise anybody. Um, and so the DNA only has to last for, you know, in that model, somewhere between, let's say, 10 years and 500 years, depending on how fast the Ice Age came after the flood. Um, so it's perfectly legitimate. I, I think that one of the things we have to do is basically do what Schweitzer did without realizing it, and that is start looking for things where they're not supposed to be. Uh, and I think that if we do that, uh, that it, well, that, that's, you know, basically what I did with carbon-14. Yeah, and if you, you take the basic approach that is like represented in cosmology with, you know, cosmological constant, you know, well, the universe is supposed to be so old, but it's expanding. You've got completely contradictory things, but if you just put the evidence here and the evidence there and then just, you know, then have it, they say, well, we need to get more evidence and then have it fight it out. What's, what's, what's the difference? You know, rather than, it seems like everybody's, you know, too much of this presupposition that this is impossible, therefore nobody looks for it, you know? So, yeah, yeah if you go looking for it and then let the chips fall. <laughs> yeah, and, and the fact of the matter is that uh, Mary Schweitzer is more in some ways is more useful to us as a long ager than she is as a short ager because I can tell you that if this stuff had been discovered by the Creation Research Institute or the Geoscience Research Institute and we tried to publish it, we would not have gotten into science when, when she did. It just would not have happened. And... Uh, and so, you know, rather than being upset because people don't totally agree with us, we should be thankful that God is using them sometimes even kind of maybe partly against their will. Don't knock it. Enjoy it. Anyway, uh, next week we'll look at the evidence that, that um, DNA, uh, that protein shouldn't last that long. And, um, and we'll see whether, the, uh, whether iron can really do what it's claimed to do uh, uh, by Dr. Schweitzer.